Okay, welcome. Uh, this lecture is going to be on food microbiology. A lot of times when people think about this, they think about, oh, the food is spoiled and everything else. But there's something to be said for the microbiology, microorganisms that help to actually make some food. And we're Excuse me. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. We're also gonna talk about how storage means can be used to inhibit microbial growth and thereby inhibits um, spoilage. So with that, let's go forward. Um, Now, here is a dad who is taking time with his little one, and he is checking out the date for the milk. And wants to make sure that it's not spoiled or anything, so he can uh, give it to his son. Okay? So, let's look at terms, etc., when we look at food microbiology, we're going to be using a variety of terms here. And it's important to know them. When I say fermented, these are foods that have been intentionally altered by carefully controlling the activity of bacteria, yeasts, or molds. This is a generalized term, and it describes any desirable change. That's emphasis, desirable change, imparted by a microorganism on the food. Case in point, uh, blue cheese, sour cream, miso, soy sauce. We can go on and on and on, and we will in a bit. But when I take that term and I, and I put it aside, like a lot of people, they think of spoilage. This is the biochemical changes in foods introduced or induced by microorganisms that are not desirable. They can include changes in color, flavor, production of toxins, and the actual decay of the food. Now, preservatives are compounds that inhibit the growth of microorganisms, especially those that cause food spoilage. Um, Preservatives do not necessarily have to be foreign chemicals, but basically how you store the food. For example, um, if you want to avoid food spoilage, you can reduce the amount of water in the food, or you can put them into a altered uh, atmospheric environment. Okay. Not just necessarily vacuum, but can be all nitrogen or all carbon dioxide. Okay, let's go on here. So let's take a look in history and how did they handle preventing food from being spoiled? When you look at ancient times, food was preserve to extend storage or prevent spoilage. Um, some individuals would mix it with salt. That's why salt was so absolutely important in ancient times, because it would create the conditions necessary to inhibit organisms from making foods go bad. But another way to do it is to basically uh, have it where foods were fermented to make them last in hot and otherwise unfavorable environments, those conditions that would encourage spoilage. So uh, the ancient Romans drank wine since consuming fruit juice was impossible. This was due to the lack of refrigeration to prevent spoilage. It's interesting to note that only the emperor could have cold fruit juice in the morning, and, and a lot of times what happens is they had such a sophisticated way of doing things. Um, they would have literally a person um, who would basically take a chariot 
up to an area of a very high mountain where there was snow, take the snow, bring it all the way down so that the emperor that morning could have cold um, fruit juice. Now, milk has been found to ferment, um, ferment very well in animal skin pouches. That is the stomach of an animal. And it would become yogurt or cheese for the Bedouins of the Middle East. A lot of times what happens is in um, certain uh, cattle, when you have calves, they'll also have present in their stomach renin, which causes the uh, milk to sort of ferment. And then also it will uh, basically separate out the whey from the uh, curd. The curds would become the yogurt or the cheese for these Bedouins. Now, if you look at all these foods here, what do you see? You see a lot of products that were made by some type of microorganism. Cheese, wine, bread. And we're going to go through some of that too. But it's something that we, we take for granted today. If you ask, how do you make bread? People would say, well, I don't know. I just go down to the grocery store and get it. Okay. But the production of bread, like the production of many different types of food products that uses microorganisms are very, very, um, one, they're interesting, but two, there's a, quite a few ways to do it. Now, what about food spoilage? Huh. There are many incidents in history that describe food poisoning. One of the better ones that's known is uh, in the Middle Ages of Europe, they had egg rot poisoning. Now, uh, egg rot is basically this fungal little sprout that you see in the heads of rye. Okay. Rye was uh, a common food for a good part of Europe. Now, egg rots contain this, this compound called egratomine, which is a powerful fungal alkaloid. And that can lead to what we call St. Anthony's fire. By the way, it's not been totally something that's ancient. It has happened in modern times, for example, eight, uh, 1951 at Pont Saint Esprit, France. Let me just ex extend upon this concept here for a minute. Um, there would be those who would get egg rot poisoning and head off, you know, on a donkey or a horse or whatever, mostly donkeys, and go to the local hospital. And literally, what egg rot to mean has is this capability to do extremely powerful vasoconstriction. So literally, their legs would or limbs would become gangrenous. An individual uh, could be on a donkey and heading out uh, along a pathway and look down. And the next thing you know, the leg had come off, gotten caught in the brush. And they didn't feel a thing because basically uh, the poison, agrotamine, had basically cut off the circulation, cut off the function of nerves, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all a particular fungal alkaloid from the actual egg rot. And this person just basically, you know, they didn't have wheat as much. They had more rye. Wheat was considered for the noble, noblery or uh, the high and, and, and very, very rich. A lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, food preservation in the Middle, Middle Ages was based on salt. Some of it was drying. Occasionally, it was preserving some food, mostly fish and brine. Now, I'll help you to understand this for a second. Salt was a basic commodity. If you salted something, you basically would draw out the water and thereby create the conditions that the food would be somewhat dried. It would be um, 
incapable of sustaining microbial growth. Now, in other situations, you would hang things out to dry and they would basically dry after a period of time. But here's one of the problems. How do you take, let's say, fish and you've basically, you know, fished for a bit and you've harvested a large number of fish? How do you keep those, that food source from going bad? Well, what they did was, of course, they had to put them in brine. Sometimes what they do is they would pickle them, which is mixed, mixing them with vinegar. The vinegar would drop the pH. You see, some of the microorganisms for leading to, to let's say, decay of fish, uh, well, salt's not going to do anything. Brine's not going to do anything. But if you put them in a very low pH like vinegar, and that's where we get into pickled herring and pickled this and pickled that, they would be able to be sustained and stored for some time. Here you see examples of spoilage of food. Fruits, you can see the fungi here and here. Now you can see the bread here and you have the uh, different types of molds. Some of these we were showing you in labs previously. And you have here corn, which has gotten really, really loaded with different types of microorganisms. And if I'm not mistaken, that's a lemon. Now, it is important to understand this. Lemons, okay, and the microorganisms that can break down uh, things like lemons, etc. Fungi can handle, uh, have a broader range of existence than, let's say, bacteria. So they can break down stuff that would normally have pHs of 3 and 4, etc. Hence, the breakdown of the lemon. Here we have some other fruit that have undergone breakdown, some of it bacterial, and you can see here some of this is fungal, as you can see in this uh, mold-like formation right here. Now, what influences the growth of microbes? Some of it I've already given you, but Let's go into this a little bit more in depth. There are a variety of factors, different factors that affect the growth of microorganisms on foods. Now, we break them into two major classes, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic, these are the factors naturally present in the food. These include moisture, acidity, nutrients. Extrinsic are the factors that are environmental conditions for the foods. These include temperature and atmosphere of storage. This is where we get into all sorts of neat things that have become really important in the 20th and in the 21st century. You can store certain things and put them into a modified atmosphere. For example, coffee beans. And you see these one-way valves. So if you squeeze on the the bag of beans, air would come out a little bit and it would be something that they were stored in, carbon dioxide or nitrogen. Uh, you might smell a little bit of the bean, but nothing comes in. Temperature, some of the things that we store today, we freeze. We put in uh, refrigerators so you've cooled it down. But you do have to keep in mind that the lack of moisture or high acidity, in other words, a low pH, can restrict the growth of bacteria. But as I mentioned earlier, fungi will flourish at lower moisture content conditions and in some conditions of lower pH. You have to keep in mind that various microorganisms will compete for nutrients and resources. All right. So sometimes what you have is not just one microorganism leading to uh, spoilage, but actually several, and one of them will crowd out the others. So you can have bacteria overwhelm fungi due to the speed of reproduction of bacteria over eukaryotic fungi, but 
Some species favor a more acidic environment, for example, lactic acid bacteria. And thus, due to their production of lactic acid, they're going to drop the pH and they will, in essence, crowd out other organisms that are much more pH sensitive. Okay. Now, there is a factor you need to be very aware of. It's called AW or water availability. Sometimes the W, you'll have a capital A and the W will be sort of a subscript below it. What is this? This is the measure of the amount of water available in foods. Now, pure water obviously is 1.0. A lot of fresh foods are about or above 0 0.98. Ham has an AW of 0 0.91. Jam has an a, a AW of 0 0.85. And we have, of course, some cakes that have uh, the AW of 0 0.70. But keep in mind, you have to have tonicity considerations. If you forget tonicity, remember you have in any solution, you have the solvent, such as water, and the solute, which is all of these other uh, compounds. Now, if you remember these from biology, you're going to be thinking to yourself, oh yeah, oh tonicity, I can have this hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. True, true. The interesting thing is, is that if you're able to pull out some of the moisture, you now have a greater concentration of solutes, which will include, you know, sugar or salt content, and what they do is they cause this imbalance such that the food moisture is not as available for microorganisms. This compared to fresh foods, which spoil more quickly than dry foods because they have usually a higher AW. But bacteria require above 0 0.90 for growth, although there are some Staphylococcus species that can reside on uh, structures such as dry human skin with, with a um, AW of 0 0.86. This is basically why S. auris and other Staphylococcus species can live on cured ham and other cured meats. They can hang in there with a diminished AW and still thrive. But fungi can grow at 0 0.80, which is really much, much lower. Now, another factor that plays a role in this is pH factors. Many of the species of food pathogens and other bacteria are inhibited by acidic conditions. They can't grow below pH of 4.5. There are some exceptions. One of them is lactic acid bacteria which can grow in a pH as low as 3.5. Fungi can grow on pH much lower. And that's where I bring up that lemon there. They can even spoil a lemon at a pH of 2.2, okay? Part of this is that pH will influence toxin production of select bacteria. Colostridium botulinum cannot grow nor produce toxins in a pH below 4.5. That's why C. botulinum doesn't exist in very acidic foods. If you go out and you do canning, for example, there's a difference between canning peas and beans versus tomatoes. Tomatoes, you have to have what is called just a hot water bath. Peas and beans, because they have a much higher pH, you have to either add some acid, such as lemon juice or something. You have to drop the acid, and then you may have to do a pressure cook there. The problem today is that we have some tomatoes that have been bred to be lower acid, and therefore they're going to require more stringent canning technique if you're doing things like making your tomatoes into salsa or sauce or anything else. 
there are ways to get around that. If you've had any canning experience, you would just take a small amount of lemon juice, pour it in. No, you don't really taste the lemon juice as much. But what it does is it drops the pH sufficient so it would inhibit any bacteria from growing. Now, there's another area that we talk about, another factor, and that's nutrient availability. Many of the foods become a growth medium for microorganisms because they supply special nutrients or nutritional factors such as vitamins. For example, members of the Pseudomonas group uh, can spoil foods because they can synthesize essential nutrients and thrive in multiple temperatures. Yes, even refrigerants. Okay. So, Another factor I wanted to bring up was biological barriers. Now, when you think about this, this is some uh, a really important way to think about it. How do we keep the food from being spoiled? Simple. You keep your eggs in shells. No, well, don't, don't you need them to uh, refrigerate? Yeah, that's true, you do. But a lot of these biological barriers, such as the shells on eggs or the rinds of the citrus fruits or the skins of apples and other protective layers such as like you have cocoa shells, coconut shells, these all prevent spoilage of what is on the inside. Now, it must be noted, it's very easy to, you get to see the effect of uh, some of the microbes. If you have an opened or cut fruits, the food will basically lose their protection to spoilage. Um, one of the situations is if you cut an apple and after a while you leave that opened area for just a little bit of time, you start seeing it change color. Well, that's oxidation. Okay. Now we have antimicrobial chemicals. It's interesting to note that some of these compounds exist naturally in the foods, okay? And when you take a look at an egg white, it's rich in lysozyme, which of course would break down bacteria. Benzoic acid that is present in cranberries. Allicin is present in garlic. And the peroxidase system in raw milk. Now, one factor that you do have to keep in mind is that the lack of moisture or high acidity restricts the the growth of bacteria, yet fungi, they'll flourish, as I've mentioned, at lower moisture content. And uh, in other cases, they're going to do some uh, situations that you would not expect because now you don't have, they don't have to compete for uh, nutrients and resources with the bacteria. Now, you want to keep in mind also that bacteria can overwhelm fungi. As I've mentioned, they have a, a much more rapid reproduction rate. And uh, the speed of the reproduction of bacteria can overwhelm the eukaryotic one. But some species will favor that acidic environment. Lactic acid bacteria are one type. And in some cases, it is the lactic acid bacteria that helps in the processing of food, such as milk being turned into uh, cheese, etc. We'll get into that in a little bit. So, what we're going to do is move into another part here. Now, we've been dealing with intrinsic factors, okay? Factors that are present within that food material. Now let's deal with the extrinsic. First, storage temperatures. If you have something below the freezing point, water crystallizes to ice and becomes unavailable for microorganisms. All microbial growth will halt. And in some cases, during that freezing, some of the microbes will die because when they have their water freezing, it will form ice crystals and puncture the cells. Now, some organisms can thrive at low temperatures, psychrophiles and psychrotrophs, and this includes some of the members of Pseudomonas. Other organisms can thrive in low temperatures of our refrigerators, whereas 
some of them are just going to just slow down only to become active again back at room temperatures. Let's talk about atmosphere. As I mentioned to you before, the modified atmospheres of some special uh, storage uh, setups for food. When you really have an oxygen-free uh, situation, a lot of the organisms that thrive in an oxygen-free atmosphere will become much more present, and that's anaerobes. Now, the obligate anaerobes include Clostridium botulinum, and that can exist in a thick stew because it's an air-free environment, or the air-free can if it was improperly processed. Botulinum is easily found in the soil. So when you get when you get rain splattering a little bit of dirt onto, let's say, your green beans or something, you've got to not only wash them, but you have to process them at a point uh, that will destroy the endospores of such species as Colostridium botulinum. And that's what you have to keep in mind there. Okay. The other issue is high temperatures may not destroy some organisms, especially those with endospores. That's why you've got to go at much, much higher temperatures. Okay. So another extrinsic factor when it comes to atmosphere is modified atmosphere. And I've been talking about this. Uh, years ago, I used to work at a, a NASA technology transfer um, facility, and they would have a lot of the different companies come in, and they wanted to find out about how to set up different types of modified atmospheres. Well, today we have these little packets. You probably have seen them in any of a variety of types of foods. For example, let me just take, uh, if you're a beef jerky fan, You'll see a little tiny mini packet, uh, maybe about like two by two, and it says do not eat. And what that is is an oxygen scavenger. It is set up to remove oxygen from the food package. Now, that way you don't have spoilage of that particular food product. Sometimes instead, the food container, which will be able to hold the food, um, is going to be basically sealed. But beforehand, its carbon dioxide levels are enriched or it has a nitrogen enhanced atmosphere. And that's going to prevent the growth of aerob aerobic bacteria. Okay. All uh, right. Now, let's talk about some of the situations where food microbiology comes into making food and beverage production. Some of these processes are, are really almost like mired in art. In other words, you know, the scientific understanding of the process is one thing and art is another. And I'll give you a real quick example. When I was still living in Massachusetts, I went up to this place where they had made blueberry wine. And there was a guy that was decanting off from his fermentation. So I started asking him some interesting questions. He actually got a lot of his ideas from a gentleman down in Florida who had made all sorts of different wines. Now, it's one thing to sit there and go, I'm going to make strawberry wine or I'm going to make grape wine. But how about wine based on oranges or ruby red grapefruit juice or even more so coconuts? And so he told me these things. I was thinking, hmm. I said, did you taste any of this stuff? He says, yeah. I said, well, what about the coconut wine? He said, well, it had a really distinct coconut flavor to it, but it was drinkable. So let's look at some of these different organisms and how they help. First off, lactic acid bacteria. Now, these have helped produce food for basically thousands of years. 
And they know this for a fact because in some cases they will look at some of the pottery and such, which are really what? A container. And they'll see various remnants of A, B, C, or D, food or other materials. So the acids of the lactic acid bacteria are going to help inhibit the growth of other spoilage organisms. And various food products have benefited from lactic acid processes. If you look at this chart, you will see a variety of foods produced using lactic acid bacteria. A variety of milk products, and yes, vegetables. So pickles and sauerkraut, and eventually you get to meats. So you have the dry and semi-dry sausages, okay? And what you have to keep in mind is that some of these things, uh, some of these techniques, they're around right now, and you could do them yourself. But it's best to also, you know, review a book, and some of them have gotten to the point where it's almost like a cookbook. Do this, do this, do this, do this, and boom. And so you have pickles, and you have olives, and kimchi, and... You know, you have yogurt, etc. So when we talk about dairy foods, usually lactic acid bacteria come from the udder, are introduced into the milk. Now, in some much more cleaner places, they would add the lactic acid bacteria as sort of a an additive. But what they do is this, the lactic acid bacteria will take the, the milk sugar, that's lactose, convert it via fermentation process to lactic acid. Now, one thing is that is going to inhibit the growth of other bacteria, but as the pH drops, it's going to cause um, basically uh, this coagulation of milk proteins, and it is also going to uh, lead to a denaturing of these proteins so that it becomes easier to extract out. Let's go through the steps. Starter culture. Your microorganism culture is used to initiate the fermentation process for the milk product. Then we have cheese, which is classified in various grades. Very hard, hard, semi-soft, and soft, depending on the water content. With cheese, this is made by fermenting uh, using a lactococcus, which is also referred to as streptococcus, that was the older name, cremoris, and lactococcus lactus. Now, the lactic acid, as I mentioned, is going to coagulate the milk proteins. So you have, if you remember Old Mother Hubbard, not Old Mother Hubbard, um, it was the little girl... A little Miss Muffet sitting on her tuppet, eating her curds and whey. The curds were the milk proteins that had coagulated. The whey was sort of this watery, but still containing some calcium um, portion. Now, in our manufacturing today, we usually just retain the curds and get rid of the whey. Now, renin is used to speed up the process of coagulation if the prod, uh, milk product is to be made into cottage cheese. Now, renin comes from a protein found in calf stomachs, but they have found that there are ways, particularly for those who are uh, vegetarians, they can make it artificially through, I think it's biotechnology, and it can be used to make the cheese that is acceptable for these individuals. So we're at the point with curds. And so what do we do with them? We press them. We basically slate them. We shape them into storage containers, wheels. Um, and then there's a ripening that occurs, which may impart different flavors. Ripening is also helped by various bacteria. Propernium uh, bacterium, Shermani, that's if you want to see Swiss cheese, you know, the big holes. 
or fungi, which is Penicillium roquefort, which makes the Roquefort, or the Gorgonzola cheese. If you're a, a fan of brie, then it's Penicillum candidium, or Penicillum camberti for cambert. Also, you're going to have a salting step. And that plus bacteria acids, usually propionic acid, will help prevent the spoilage organisms from growing on the cheese. All right. And here's the process right here. First, you have the workers. They've got this large vat of uh, basically milk. And what they're now going through is the process of lactic acid and renin, which is going to cause the milk proteins to coagulate. They will separate out the casein and other types of proteins. And so what you have left is really just liquid whey. Now the curds, all of that is going to be separated. And then you're going to start making that into sort of the various cheeses, etc. Now in some cases, the curds are salted, they're pressed into blocks or wheels, and you see that all the time. Let's talk about yogurt for a minute. Now, uh, remember in the 70s, yogurt got fairly popular. It was sort of like the new health food. And so people would actually be able to get electrical uh yogurt makers and it would heat it up and you know you mix it up with some of the bacteria and it, all that stuff you can get yourself your own yogurt okay but what is yogurt it's concentrated milk and it's inoculated with streptococcus thermophilus and lactobacillus vulgaris and you incubate this at 40 to 45 degrees celsius and you're going to have, because this is a fermentation process, various metabolites, acetaldehyde and lactic acid, etc. And they're going to contribute to the flavor of the yogurt. Now, acidophilus milk, this is a product of lactobacillus acidophilus fermentation. There has been some evidence that should suggest that L-acidophilus may enhance intestinal health. What about pickled vegetables? Now, originally, this was a means to preserve vegetables, such as cucumbers, pickles, cabbage, sauerkraut. And mostly using naturally existing bacteria. You can, I've actually seen people do this. They, they will shred up the, the cabbage, add a little bit of water, add some salt into a container, and they will allow naturally the lactic acid to thrive and prepare their food. And they may store it for some months before they have it. And it's still fine and healthy. Uh, bacteria. Leuconostoc, mesenterioides, and lactobacillus brevis, lactobacillus plantarum are used in some of these situations and as of course the acids build up other bacteria are inhibited from growing on the food so that prevents any spoilage but this process is used to make some pickles olives and other vegetable products and then we have fermentation of meats now meats meat that is fermented with lactobacillus or pediococcus bacteria uh, usually what happens is this is as if you're making like um, the deli meats of salami and pepperoni and summer sausage and things like that. But you also usually add other materials like salt and nitrites. And this is used to inhibit the harmful bacteria like Clostridium botulinum. And they will add some sugar as a substrate for fermentation. And the fermented meat is later, later packaged into casings. Okay. Here is the next area. Now, this is where we use the alcoholic fermentation by yeast. All right. And everybody says alcoholic, so it's got to be just, you know, wine and beer. No. 
We're going to talk to you a little bit about vinegar, and we're going to talk to you about bread. Okay? The main key point is that anything that has sugars in it will uh, be able to be converted. Now, with sake, you have to have the amylase uh, from the mold that will convert the starch in the rice to sugar. That's why sake is also referred to as rice wine. And then it's fermented with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Beer, no problem. Beer is basically where you have enzymes in the, the germinated barley, and they will convert, the, the organisms will convert the starches of barley and other grains to sugar. Then this is fermented by S. cerevisiae again. Now, with distilled spirits, it's a little bit different because what you have to think about this is first you make sort of this pre-material and you have sugars and starches that are converted to sugars and then they're fermented by S. cerevisiae. But then with distillation, what you do is you are going to purify and increase the amount of alcohol. Usually you can get to about maybe yeah, about what you'd see with wine, about 20%. But if you want something that's 40 proof, 80 proof, 100 proof, etc., distillation is all is, is going to be a necessary technique. Okay? Vinegar, we're going to talk about. This is alcohol that's produced by fermentation, and yet we oxidize it to acetic acid by species of gluco no bacter or acetobacter. And with breads, we come back to acerevisiae. It is going to ferment the sugar. And then you're going to have this expansion. That's when we talk about bread rising or leavening. And that's due to the carbon dioxide. And what happens after that is then you get ready to bake the bread. Now, you've got some alcohol that's in that bread. How do you get rid of it? Very simple. The alcohol will evaporate during the baking process. Now, sad to say, some people have taken the ethanol and considered it um, a greenhouse gas. And so this has taken a lot of small bakeries and, and, and killed them because they, they don't have the funds to make this extraction process and then sequestering of the alcohol uh, as the uh, everything goes up the baking flue. And as I've said, a lot of this depends on Saccharomyces, which can convert simple sugars to ethanol and carbon dioxide for alcohol fermentation. It's interesting to note that prior to a lot of our sophistication, the persons, let's say, in the early, um, early millennium, between zero to about a thousand, etc., how did they make wine? There are wild yeasts that are found on the dull, waxy film of the grapes. They're called must. No, excuse me, they're called bloom, excuse me. Now, today, of course, we have the techniques where we have exacting yeast and we know what we want, etc. And if we are dealing with spoilage bacteria, we may have to use sulfur dioxide, uh, which will kill off the bacteria. Otherwise, that would make the wine spoiled. And then we also have very specific yeast cultures that are used to achieve the fermentation efficiently and may be used for um, particular types of wine that you're going to make, champagne, etc. So you have the Saccharomyces, specific strains. They happen to be more resistant to sulfur dioxide than the wild strains and other bacteria. The spoilage bacteria can cover the wine or convert the wine to acetic acid. So all you've got is vinegar. Nah, that's not what I want. 
The dry wines that you consume use up more of the sugars. The sweet wines have more of the sugars present. Now, grapes originally are crushed to yield what is called must, and that is composed of grape solids and juices. The starter culture of specific yeast is added to the fermentation process. After filtering and extraction of the wine from the solids, the wine is then aged in oak casks. Now, it's interesting that these various oak casks can add unique flavors to the wine. And wine can be up to about 14% alcohol. All right. Now, you have also, as we're talking about wine, malolactic fermentation. This is with using lactic acid bacteria, the leuconostoc, and it will convert malic acid to lactic acid. And this is needed for some grapes that are uh, cultured in cool regions so because they end up making higher levels of malic acid. Now, this process will mellow the flavor. Rice wine, as I said, which is also known as sake, is cooked wine, and then what happens is it's you inoculate it with the fungus. This is Aspergillus oryzae, and that will uh, produce the enzyme amylase. It'll break down the starches down to sugars. Then you add the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which will ferment the sugars to alcohol and carbon dioxide. And finally, you may add on some further lactic acid bacteria, uh, which will add flavor by producing lactic acid and other flavoring compounds. Now, as you can see here, this whole process here, process here, crushing, and then you, after you've crushed it, add the yeast, then you do the fermentation. Now, it's inter interesting to note also that um, when you are going through this, how do you get the difference between red wine and white wine? It's whether you use the full must, which will contain a lot more of the pigments to account for red wine, or you just have clear juices. And that's where you filter out a lot of the, um, grape skins, etc. So you get a more of a white wine. Then you go through a process of settling. So what happens is you're going to transfer the fermented material to a tank so that the solids can be tapped off, removed, and then we put them in for aging. Now, red and white wines are aged in oak barrels, and then we do the bottling, okay? What about beer? <clears throat> now, this is a process starting with a starch and we must convert those starches into sugars. Then we ferment them. You have barley, which is best known. It's sprouted or germinated. The malted barley or malt is dried, roasted, then soaked in warm water to make mash. The mashing process allows the enzymes in the grains to break the starches into some sugars. Now, you may add some adjuncts, meaning extra materials like starches, sugars, or whole grains to further the process. Now, this is a step that may create color, flavor, and foam. Also, somewhere around this area, you're going to have the sugary liquid, which is referred to as wort, uh, and that's extracted. And then you add hops. Now, a hop plant is more or less just these little flower buds that you see. And they're added to provide an antibacterial compounds. And they add somewhat of a bitter taste. The wort is then boiled and filtered and cooled before the yeast is added. And then we add the yeast. And it's selective. Different types of beer take different types of uh, the yeast. Saccharomyces carlsbergenus. These are bottom fermenters and they use to make lager beer. 
Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a top fermenter. And there's specific strains, and they make ales and porters and stout beers. The fermentation will continue. It will create beers of anywhere from 3.4 to 6%. And then the beer is lagered. Uh, meaning that we have a settling process to get rid of the solids, filtering, and bottled. I will tell you from um, some experience that one of the things that will happen in some foreign beers is just as they're ready to cap it, they add again another amount of uh, yeast and another amount of sugar. And so if you look at the bottle at the very bottom, there'll be some settled yeast. This combination will allow for uh, a further production of alcohol to boost the total alcohol content of that beer. And as you can see here, here you have the milling. So the malt, that is the germinated barley, you crack them open and then you have the mashing may add also some more malt, water, and sometimes other types of materials. And the spent grains are eventually removed after the enzymes in the mash convert the starches into fermentable sugars. In this process here, you add the hops, then you boil. Now the hops are gonna be added again, they have certain antimicrobial capabilities. You will extract they're going to add to the flavor and you're going to basically concentrate the wort and activate the enzymes obviously with the boiling and kill most of the microbes and the pre and precipitate the proteins okay spent hops are then removed now you've got this wonderful kind of sugary solution there and it's gonna have some of the components from the hops and some of the components from the barley. And then what you do is you add the yeast. The yeast is then gonna ferment. And what eventually happens is you're gonna uh, remove the excess uh, yeast cells. Uh, it's interesting that yeast cells in essence are those organisms that make their own waste, which is in this case alcohol, and that's what kills them off when the alcohol levels grow too high. You may then do aging. And when I say may, it depends. Some places will store it for a longer period of time, some will short, do a shorter period of time, and then you get into the bottling. Now, what about distilled spirits? Like I said, the process to make scotch, whiskey, and gin is similar to beer, but the wort is not boiled. When the fermentation is complete, the ethanol is purified by distillation. Let's talk about tequila for a second. That's fermented from juices of the agave plant, and we use a different bacteria. That's Zymomonas mobilis. And finally, we get to another one that's a little bit different, uh, uh, vinegar. What happens is the alcohol produced by the fermentation process is going through oxidation to acetyl acid, excuse me, acetic acid by the fermentation, by the bacteria species, gluconobacter acetobacter, or acetobacter. You see, what these do is a process of oxidation taking the alcohol and converting it into acetic acid. The bacteria are strictly aerobic, and therefore they're gonna oxidize the alcohol to acetic acid. Now, this is what you would see for a vinegar generator. If you take a look here, you've got oxygen depleted air that leaves here. You have the fermented fruit juice. Now it's fermented, which means it contains some alcohol, some ethanol. And then this is a container that has a huge amount of beech wood chips, but they're covered with a layer of acetobacter. So this is something that's going to be sort of your bioconverter. You're going to pump air up 
this direction, okay? As it gets up to this top part, you've already basically um, depleted a lot of the oxygen, all right? You've got a wood grating here, and you've got cooling coils, because there is, as this process goes on, some amount of heat that has been released, okay? And what has happened is, as you can see from this formula down here, ethanol plus oxygen is going to leave you with acetic acid and H2O. So this chamber here basically collects the finished vinegar, and then you have the product removal here by the spigot. Now let's talk for a few minutes about bread. Okay. Bread. Well, we have certain strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They're referred to as baker's yeast, and they're used in the commercial baking industry. During the fermentation, the carbon dioxide causes bread to have a very honeycombed uh, texture. Okay? Because you're going to have all of these little, uh, build, uh, little areas that build up bubbles of carbon dioxide. Now, alcohol is also going to be produced. So this yeast is going to produce both alcohol, ethanol, and carbon dioxide. And this is going to basically evaporate out of the bread when you get through the process of baking the bread. You can see here, here's all the little holes. That's caused by literally carbon dioxide. When you heat the bread at a, let's say, your, your bread bakeries and such like that, what's going to happen is carbon dioxide is going to eventually leak out, but also the ethanol will leak out as well. And you can see how this works out. Very simple. You have the ingredients, yeast, milk, or water, oil, flour, sugar, a salt, and sugar. And you go through this process right through here. You mix it by kneading it. You have a rise, and this is due to fermentation, and there's going to be a lot of CO2 that is going to be present in various little bubbles here and there. You're also going to have some gaseous ethanol. Now, when you're done and you're ready to bake it, uh, this period of baking, you're going to get the dough. You're first going to insert it into uh, the proper loaves, loaf-shaped, um, I can say it, pans. And what happens is you're going to start secondary rising, but then as the temperature rises, you are going to eventually have a situation where the CO2 and the ethanol uh, basically um, escape during the baking process. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about some action by moles, and we're going to talk about um, how some moles are used to add flavor or texture to food. Okay, soy sauce. Soy sauce is made by inoculating a mixture of cooked soybeans and roasted cracked wheat with either Aspergillus oryzae or Aspergillus soja. This mixture is called koji. It is allowed to stand as the carbohydrates and the proteins are being broken down, and then the mixture is transferred to an 18% salt solution where salt to uh, tolerant organisms such as uh, Zygosaccharomyces ruxi and one species of Torlopsis convert the product to soy sauce. That's where you get your soy sauce. What about cheese? Well, various species of penicillin create unique coloring and flavors of cheeses. And this chart gives you a variety of these. Don't worry, you don't have to sit down and memorize everything, but it is kind of nice to see, understand clearly how the microorganisms help you in the production of different 
types of foods, if you notice, all over the world. Now we're going to talk about food spoilage. Now, usually spoiled food are considered unsafe as they may be containing foodborne uh, pathogens. They may have also uh, the uh, microorganisms may be depositing different types of toxins, etc. For bacteria, there's a wide range of organisms that exist. It depends on the food, whether it's meat, fruits, dairy products, vegetables, seafoods. Pseudomonas have a wide range that can grow in different foods. That's why you have to keep in mind that psychophilic uh, pseudomonads can multiply at refrigerator temperatures. Urwenia has enzymes that degrade pectin. Now, that's a structural polysaccharide in plant cell walls. In essence, Irwinia is the type of organism that will soften up fruits and vegetables and leave them to go bad. Actinobacter, which can cause wine to spoil and turn into vinegar. Alkaligenes, which forms a glycocalyx. And what, I, what you have to think about is this. This is what causes a string of slime or ropiness that you would see in raw milk. Now, the difference between raw milk and the milk you get down at your store is it's been pasteurized. By going through that pasteurization process, it kills off a lot of the organisms that may be in the raw milk, okay, extending its shelf life. Also, milk can be spoiled, that is, turned sour by various lactic acid species, such as Streptococcus, Leuconostoc, and Lactobacillus. Finally, canned food can be spoiled with Bacillus coagulans, Bacillus sterothermophilus, and, of course, the Clostridium species, such as Clostridium botulinum. And this is serious. That's why if you go back into some of the other chapters and talk about the canning process, some companies will go to a D factor of 17 to process the cans and to uh, reduce any possibility of microorganisms in there. Okay. When we talk about fungi, though, since fungi can more easily grow in acidic environments, they can destroy food even if the bacteria can't thrive. So we're talking about food spoilage organisms like Rhizopus, Altenaria, Penicillin, Aspergillus, and Boiditritis. You want to also keep in mind that the fungus, that fungal means of reproduction, that is the spores, means that one bad piece of fruit can lead to fungal spoilage quickly spreading in the refrigerator. You know, you hear that saying, uh, one bad apple spoils the whole barrel of apples. To a point, that's true. Because if that first apple is creating the spores necessary, very quickly the rest of the spores may become airborne and settle on the other pieces of fruit. Now, if we talk about Aspergillus flavins, that normally infects peanuts, some other grains. But the, the seriousness of this is that it produces a carcinogenic toxin, aflatoxin. So if you see the peanuts and you see a blue area on that peanut, don't eat it because that's probably Aspergillus flavins. Now, we're going to move from here into foodborne illnesses for a little bit. We can make a whole course of this. But let me introduce you to this concept. When we talk about food poisoning, it is foodborne illness caused by the consumption of a pathogen or toxin of the pathogen during consumption of a food product. In other words, Somehow the pathogen got into the food and then a person unaware of this consumed it. Now, obviously, to limit food poisoning, there are government regulations. They are very strict on commercial processing, handling, and, and packaging of food. And not just government in the sense of federal 
or state, local. If you look at uh, your um, basically public health department, and let's say you went out to XYZ restaurant or ABC fast food joint and got very sick very quickly afterwards, you can notify them. And they will say, okay, give us the time and date. And basically we're at eight around, let's say one o'clock and all that stuff. They will go in there. And sometimes it's a matter of their refrigeration unit had failed or they had gotten some stuff that was wilted, but they decided to go anyways and sell it. And that's horrible. The other thing is that residential use of food and retail sales of food can lead to food poisoning from various means. There is a database called FoodNet, and that's really the Foodborne Disease Active Surveillance Network, and it's part of CDC. This is a program that monitors and collects data on laboratory confirmed cases of diarrhea illnesses in 10 states. So it covers 15% of the, use, uh, the U.S. population so that it can gain insight and perhaps prevent foodborne illness. It is not unusual to have some of the situations where doctors have to call out that are outside of those 10 states and say, I think we have a problem here. You know, the people that monitor some of this um, may be individuals that are in the emergency room. And they keep seeing not one, not two, but it's like, you know, you got five, 10, 15 people coming in. And that's where you're going to have some of the restaurants that they had contaminated uh, green onions or they had something else that was in their uh, specialty and made people sick. Now, there's a difference between that and foodborne intoxication. Foodborne intoxication is an illness that results from the consumption of an exotoxins produced by the micro, microorganism growing in the food product. You got to keep in mind it's a toxin. It's not the organism that causes the illness. The toxin may or may not be neutralized by heating. So let's take a look at a few of these. Staphylococcus aureus can grow on salty products with an AW of 0.91, or another way to think of this, creamy pastries, starchy salads left out at room temperature. The organism will thrive in moist, rich foods where most other organisms have been killed. That's why, you know, you don't leave on a hot day that wonderful family picnic that you had with the stuff like like potato salads and macaroni salads or anything, just being left out for hours. You're just asking for trouble there. Also, sources of contamination. Usually it's a human carrier not properly washing hands before preparing foods. The toxin is heat stable, meaning that cooking will not destroy it. Okay? Botulism is another one. That's a paralytic disease caused by the ingestion of a neurotoxin produced by the anaerobic spore-forming gram-positive rod Clostridium botulinum. Now, this is very serious because improper canning can lead to the growth of C. botulinum inside the can. If you've probably ever heard when people say, you have a can that has got its ends bulging. Toss it. Don't open it. Don't go. Don't do anything but just dispose of it quickly. Um, one of the problems, as I mentioned before, is that C. botulinum is very common in the soil. And so if you have, let's say, green beans or you've got some other vegetable or something like that, and the water splatters mud onto that, what happens is, yes, maybe by some cooking or inadequate canning, you have um, killed off the microorganism. But if there's been time for the cultivation of the toxin, you now have the 
loaded with C. botulinum toxin. Fortunately, the toxin is heat labile, and thus heat treatment will destroy the toxin. Okay, so washing the hands is really important. No, I'm not talking about COVID, but that was one of the issues we dealt with. You don't want to come in with contaminated hands. We have to also deal with the issue of cross-contamination. In other words, you take and handle raw meat, put it on the grill, then take the meat off. If you have not washed your hands, you have contaminated meat that is ready to be eaten. Foodborne infection. This is illness due to the consumption of living pathogenic organisms during consumption of food. A lot of times consumption of poorly cooked or cross-contaminated food can lead to infection. Salmonella or Campylobacter, both organisms um, are multiply in the intestinal tract. So it's usually associated with poultry products, eggs, turkey, chicken, etc., the symptoms include diarrhea, abdominal pain, and nausea. Now, what about cross-contamination? This is the transfer of the pathogen from one item to another. Uh, for example, a cutting board. But what's better known in places where people like to uh, barbecue a lot or like to cook outside during the nice months they will take a plate with whatever, chicken or turkey or whatever meat, and they will bring it down and they will put it onto the grill. And while it's cooking, they will use the same plate where the raw meat was and put the cooked meat now on it. And now that cooked meat is now contaminated. There's a well-known organism called Escherichia coli O157 colon H7. These organisms are usually associated with ground meat that has been prop in poorly cooked. And individuals have died from it. In some restaurants, uh, I believe Jack in the Box in the 90s had a problem with it. This can lead to bloody diarrhea or hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is where you have the red blood cells are being destroyed and the remnants are blocking up the kidneys, you end up with kidney failure. Okay. So if you take a look at these two uh, slides, this first one here, you can see how you can have Staph A um, become sort of a case of either toxin-containing uh, poisoning or whatever. Um, and staph food poisoning, nausea, abdominal cramping, vomiting, begins after four to six hours. A lot of times it's due to a food handler inadvertently transferring S. auris onto the food. Um, you have to keep in mind that's why individuals have to clean their hands repeatedly when they're in the working area. Now, Clostridium botulinum endospores, as I said, are common in, in soil, marine sediments. They contaminate various foods. The endospores can survive an adequate canning process. Canned foods are anaerobic. So here's what I'm trying to say to you. This particular species can form endospores. As a result, that's why you have to use pressure cooking. And pressure cooking is not at a temperature of 212. You raise it to about 240. And the only way that you can continue to keep water in a liquid state at, at that situation is the canned food is in a water setup, but the pressure is much higher and therefore the temperature rises you get 240 for a period of time, and basically all the endospores are destroyed, etc. But if the person ingests toxin-containing food, the symptoms include weakness, double vision, and progressively an inability to speak, swallow, and breathe. 
And this will begin within 12 to 36 hours. So in other words, this botulinum can affect neural function. And you can see how these work in various situations of food for S. auris as well as C. botulinum. And then we have also a Salmonella campylobacter. Now, this is usually if you have incomplete cooking, which would normally kill off all the pathogens. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, these organisms that survive can multiply again as the food uh, is stored at room temperature, etc., after being cooked and after cooled down. If you consume the live organisms, they're going to uh, multiply in the intestinal tract and cause disease. Symptoms include diarrhea, abdominal pain, vomiting, etc. E. coli, this is the nasty one I was mentioning to you earlier, the O157 colon H7. Even a small number of these organisms that survive can cause illness. And usually what happens is that this has been commonly seen with incomplete cooking of things like hamburger, okay? Um, what happens is the organisms will multiply in the intestinal tract, they'll cause disease, uh, they will cause severe abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea. And what will happen in some cases is they will lead to the death of individuals if they're not treated quickly and dealt with, okay? Now, this is a chart just to give you an idea of the different types of organisms and infections that do occur. Um, you want to be noticing the foods that are commonly implicated in these situations. And by the way, some of these are not bacteria. For example, norovirus is a virus. Um, a lot of places, that is companies that make some type of food or another, will monitor, they will have a microbiologist on board. Uh, they will look for areas of hazard for the possibility of contamination, etc. And therefore they try to reduce the chances of anything going bad. And if there is something that does go bad, they will uh, then notify the heads of the company and they will issue a recall. And fortunately, although recalls can be a bit, uh, let's say, uh, inconvenient, they make things a lot easier in the long and short run. By the way, you know all those people that want to run around and love raw oysters? Well, Vibro vulnificus is one of these organisms that is prominent with oysters. Okay, raw oysters I'm talking about. And if you'll notice, there are a variety of other organisms here. Um, a lot of times this will show up if the food has not been processed. Cyclosporia was an interesting case because this was more a protozoal parasite and showed up um, in the 19... 90s um and what happened was it was a, a bad contaminated batch of raspberries now all raspberries are not bad believe me i i, I enjoy raspberries myself but the cdc had to get involved because what happened was these raspberries were all used in this sort of big fruit arrangement at a wedding and about 200 people got sick. And when they looked at all the symptoms or anything, they see this parasite and they go, this is something you normally see in Asia. Well, the best story that they've been able to, uh, to follow and track back was the raspberries came from Guatemala. Somebody there was 
picking them. And of course, in farms like that, they don't have the best known situations of porta potties or whatever. And so the individual did his business and whatever and kept working. They think, I'm not sure, but they think it was somebody who was on this sort of world travel. You know, I, work, I, I, I go around to, a, to a certain areas. If I run out of money, I sit there and I work for a bit and then I take off and go to another place. And that's what happened. But it causes a lot of concern if there's not proper sanitation at the harvesting of these foods. Okay, so enough on that one. And so how do we deal with all of this? Well, there is a variety of means to maintain food preservation. You have to keep in mind by the changing of the physical or chemical properties of the food that this may encourage the microbial cultivation properties. They may be inhibited or they may be enhanced. But let's talk about the various types of um, preservation. One, we have, of course, canning, which destroys the spoilage organisms. We have pasteurization, such as what you'd see with milk, but it does happen with other liquid foods, where it's passed through a very briefly, a high temperature pipe. And that high temperature is enough to quickly kill those organisms, okay? But it doesn't kill spores. Cooking. Now, the problem there is only if you have uneven heating of foods that may not destroy pathogens. Refrigeration. Remember that refrigeration, even at a low temperature, will slow microbial growth. Now, freezing is a little different because freezing will kill microbial cells by the formation of ice crystals inside their cytoplasm, which leads to them puncturing the cell membranes. We have drying or reducing the AW to dehydrate or to add salt or sugar, making the food hypertonic has advantages. Lowering the pH, uh, fermentation that may occur. The low pH inhibits the growth of organisms. Antimicrobial chemicals. Now, these are chemicals you don't necessarily add, but may be part of the makeup of the food. In other cases, they're added in small amounts and do an effective job. So you have benzoic acid, propionic acid, sorbic acid, nitrates, sulfur dioxide, all of these are involved with inhibiting organisms. Then we have food radi irradiation. Now, for those that are in the nursing or, or allied health field, you have a lot of surgical equipment and a lot of specialized equipment that goes through uh, a treatment of either gamma rays or electron beams. These are effective in destroying DNA of any pathogen. They do not alter the flavor of, if we're going to go back to food now, of foods. And guess what? They've been used for, for years and years in spices and in meats. Surgical equipment had to be found in some way if they are disposable stuff. So a disposable cauterizer or, you know, uh, some of the basics that you would have like a butterfly cannula or something like that. With foods, though, we've had food irradiation from the time of about the 1950s forward. People think that this stuff is going to glow green and there's a Homer Simpson syndrome, and it's not true. As a matter of fact, where I am residing in, in uh, Florida right now, there are some major facilities that basically have uh, strawberries that are brought in, exposed to gamma 60, which kills off the bacteria and the mold spores that are on the outside of the strawberries enhances the shelf life of these strawberries, let's say to about 10 days or something like that. So therefore, it allows for the exportation and the transport of these strawberries to farther up 
uh, into places like um, Chicago, New England, and even up into Nova Scotia without any problems. This is a basic chart which I've included in my notes for the course. You're not expected to memorize it, but you need to be aware of some of the situations because this is one of the ways in which people are not aware of things, but can come into situations of contamination. So obviously you have the cooking range, the temperature range, the range in which a pressure canner is required to reach, the temperatures necessary to kill the spores, etc. You have also the danger zone, which is the organisms will grow quickly. And unless you have taken the food out and everybody's used it and then bring it back for storage, you're going to be starting to see that food get seriously contaminated and become a risk if it's consumed later on. And then, of course, we've got the low temperature uh, situations and the freezing. Now, this is a bit smaller of a chart, but I'm going to throw this out to you that um, basically if you have the course, you will take a look and be able to read some of these with a lot of interest. And you can always stop the recording and then scan over it. The things that I find that are interesting to this day, besides the viruses and the bacteria, etc., are some of the other items that are out there. For example, parasites. Trichinella spirellus. Well, okay, you see that a lot with pork. That's why the USDA says they can't guarantee any uh, pork is going to be free of this parasite. Therefore, anyone that goes out and consumes it must really cook the meat well. And then we have Anasakis. If you're a sushi fan, you better have someone that really knows how to handle and basically identify raw fish, what's good and not, because there have been cases of Anasakis, which is sort of a, a worm inside the flesh of the fish, that will eventually get inside someone. They bring them to the hospital. They think it's appendicitis. They begin to open up the person, and then the worm starts slithering out. That's not what you want. Okay. You have also, of course, as I mentioned to you before, the protozoan uh, Cyclosporia caninientis. Okay. So, my suggestion review the handouts. And what you want to do is review all the tools to help you to understand um, the organisms related to things like foodborne illness, etc as well as review the end of the chapter of the book. Okay, and with that, have a good day.